Damascus, October 3rd, 1918. For over two years, the Arab revolt has struck Ottoman interests in Western Arabia. They've rallied tribes, hit railways over and over, blown up 25 bridges in a single operation, cut communications, and seized a lightly defended port city on the Red Sea. Though never rallying more than 50,000, they tied down huge numbers of Ottoman troops. And when the British marched into Palestine, the Arab irregulars held their right flank. Then when the Ottomans broke, they rode for their great prize. Now Faisal, the revolt's military leader, parades into the most important of cities, Damascus, the one where he'll create a government for his Arab nation. Locals welcome him. Days before, a Syrian parliament convened to declare Syria an Arab state loyal to Sheriff Hussein, with Faisal as its head of state. But then, a British general tells Faisal to stop the celebration. Damascus, you see, belonged to the French. Faisal was no fool. He had known, well before 1918, that the British had been engaging in double-dealing. In fact, he had engaged in a bit of his own, feeling out the Ottomans on whether they would support his claim to an Arab kingdom, with him as a monarch, if he switched sides. But by 1917, he knew, heck, everyone knew, that many of the lands in his theoretical Arab state had already been claimed by the British or promised to the French. In fact, the British had promised Palestine to no less than three parties. In 1917, British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour had made a public announcement that the British government supported a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. The ploy was to convince American Jews to pressure Washington, which was dragging its feet on getting troops to the front, to speed up their support. Then on the other side of the map, they hoped the Bolshevik leadership now in power in Russia, who had decided to pull out of the war, would instead get back into the fight. But the British made a critical mistake. They'd assumed that Zionism, the idea of founding a Jewish state in Palestine in order to create a safe place for Jews to govern themselves, was universally popular among the Jewish diaspora. In actuality, it was really only popular among the Zionist faction that had been lobbying the British. Most Jewish Americans favored assimilation to their new country rather than resettlement. And then in Russia, well, sure, a few leading Bolsheviks were Jewish, but it was only around a half dozen. Not to mention, they considered Zionism a capitalist plot, and their communist ideology was anti-colonialism. So instead of getting back into the war, to show the duplicity of the ruling class, the Bolsheviks opened the Russian archive and published every secret Allied treaty that had ever been forwarded to Russia including Sykes-Picot. Whoops! British diplomats rushed to Hussein, telling him that Sykes-Picot was, uh, you know, not really a formal treaty per se. They'd still totally honor their agreement to found an Arab state. Oh, and the Balfour Declaration didn't mean the British supported an independent Jewish state. Just, you know, uh, area of sorts. I mean, there were already Jewish settlements in Palestine, right? There had been for years under the Ottomans. Y you know, guys? Mark Sykes even drew up a document stating that any future occupation of former Ottoman territories would only happen by the consent of the population. Still, the British message to Hussein and Faisal was clear. Listen, yes, we've made a lot of promises to a lot of people, but once the war is over, we'll have a big conference and work it all out. Okay? That conference would happen in 1919 in Versailles. It would last over a year. And it wasn't until the sweltering days of summer that the division of the Ottoman Empire came to the table. But by that time, the four allies dictating the conference, Britain, France, the United States, and Italy, were arguing over who got what in the Middle East. Faisal attended the conference with Lawrence as his advocate. Lawrence had even in the past drawn maps suggesting where different Arab states should go. Though, a word about that. There's this modern idea that if the conference simply listened to Lawrence, everything would have turned out all right. That's probably not true, and is a bit of a dodge to cover the fact that no local people were consulted in the division of the region. In fact, even Lawrence's own maps had question marks all over them. But it's true that negotiators weren't listening to outside advice. An inter-ally commission meant to gauge the region's feelings about independence became an exclusively American effort when all other allies pulled out. Meanwhile, colonial official and Middle East expert Gertrude Bell traveled Arabia, writing a report on local feelings about self-determination or people's interest in choosing their own government. Her conclusions were disregarded. Despite Faisal making overtures to Zionist representatives, proposing support for a Jewish state in return for an Arab one, Faisal and anyone from the region were increasingly shut out. And Mark Sykes might have been in the room to repeat his declaration about native governments needing to give consent to be governed, but he was dead.
taken as the 1918 flu pandemic burned through the conference. The United States would be the sole advocate of self-determination, but their case was undercut by Woodrow Wilson leaving due to illness, possibly also the 1918 flu. And in response to his exclusion, Faisal went back to Damascus and called a Syrian National Congress, inviting representatives from all parts of Greater Syria, which included lands now in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. There were disagreements, arguments, divisions, particularly over Faisal's overtures to Zionists at the Paris Conference. But one thing united them. Syria could not be divided, and the regions known as Palestine and Lebanon were an indivisible part of Syria. So they wrote a report and presented it to the American Commission. But even as they did so, this very division was taking place in Paris. France and Britain would divide the region between them. Not quite along the Sykes-Picot line, but something close to it. The region would be governed by mandates, British and French caretaker governments who would oversee and control local governments until they were ready for self-government. Sykes-Picot, it was decided, did not conflict with British promises to Hussein, and the independent Arab state could be in the zone of influence. Now, if that doesn't sound like an independent state, that's because it wasn't. The mandate system was a way to practice colonialism by treaty, a way for the British and French to control the region's economy and politics that would be palatable at home. Oh, and uh, what about the borders? You guessed it. They'd figure that out later. In response, in March of 1920, the Syrian National Congress proclaimed that they had formed the Arab Kingdom of Syria with Faisal as its monarch and head of government. They named a prime minister and said they would defend their state from any French incursion. This declaration hung over the San Remo Conference in April, where the Allies gathered to draw the borders of their new mandates. And to go into the specifics of every decision would take an entire series on its own. And many of them, such as separate Kurdish and Armenian states, acknowledging the Ottomans' wartime campaigns of repression, displacement, and genocide, would quickly be undone by the Turkish Civil War. Palestine would be under a British mandate, including provisions for a Jewish homeland that did not prejudice the rights and protections of those already living there. Transjordan just beside Palestine was British, and a new nation called Iraq would be formed by merging three separate and very different Ottoman provinces in Mesopotamia. Basra, in the south, was connected to the Persian Gulf and India trade. Baghdad, in the center, was agricultural and had economic links with Iran, and Mosul, in the north, was oil-rich and mountainous, with links to both Turkey and Syria. In fact, Mosul had traditionally been considered part of Syria, but the British had taken it in the war and weren't giving it up, so into Iraq it went. And that combining would have consequences. There were internal sectarian and ethnic divisions, with 20% of the population being Kurdish, a people whose lands were now split between Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. In addition, Iraq would only have 36 miles of coastline and no deep water to export its oil. All the good ports, you see, were in its smaller southerly neighbor, Kuwait. I think that's what you could call foreshadowing. France, by contrast, would have mandates over Syria and a separated Lebanon, where many Lebanese Christians lived. The French also insisted that the British agree that the territory held by Faisal, his kingdom of Syria, was illegitimate and unrecognized. When Faisal heard about this agreement, he rushed to dispatch cables to French representatives in Lebanon. He was willing to negotiate. He even appealed to the United States to make it a protectorate. The French declined, so did the United States, and Faisal's British allies had pulled out the previous year. Then on July 24, 1920, French troops scattered Faisal's army, occupied Damascus, and sent him into exile in Britain. The Arab Kingdom of Syria, proclaimed with such hope in March, had lasted 139 days. But in time, Faisal would be a king again. Legendary thanks to our patrons Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, El Mamoun Shikawi, and Orils One.